You are watching some of the horrifying events taking place in the Ukraine when on February 24th, 2022, Russia invaded that nation, massively firing rockets at every single city. The initial invasion killed thousands of people. Over 8.5 million Ukrainians fled to other countries. 14.5 million Ukrainians found themselves displaced from their own bombed out cities and homes. My guest today is Hanu Hauka, who's the founder of Great Commission Media Ministries. Hanu has come directly from the front lines of the war where he was 24 hours ago. When the war started, Hanu was in the Ukraine because his television programs were airing across that nation and featuring well-known Ukrainians telling their survival stories, how they made it through the worst storms of their life with God's help. That was exactly what the Ukrainians wanted to hear because that was exactly what they were going through. And so his programs really connected with the people. In fact, the main television network continued broadcasting his programs during the war until the Russians bombed all the TV towers in that country. Further, you will find out why this man got involved in rescuing thousands of people in the Ukrainian-Russian war zone at the risk of losing his own life. You will find out today on this special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program. I'm John Ankerberg, and what you've been watching are scenes from what's happening in the Ukraine right now. And my guest is Hanu Hoka, and he has come directly from that fighting that you are seeing to talk about what's happening there with the people and what the needs are. And we're also going to do something that the newsmen here in America can't do. He's going to talk about what's happening on the front lines, what's happening with the war. And we're going to give you a hint of where we think this war is going. And uh, Hanu, let's start at the beginning. And that is that uh, you were in Ukraine way before the war started and you were setting up a media campaign for the television that went right across the Ukraine as well as the Russian part of the Ukraine. And you were right on the border and many times you would call me and you would be going down to sleep at night. You had all of your armor on. Explain what you had on just to sleep. Yeah, we have been uh, embedded with the Ukrainian Armed Forces several times, which means that you're actually moving along with them wherever they are. You're actually sleeping in their quarters with them, and you're sitting at the same uh, breakfast table with them or the supper table, and you're talking, and then you go out on what we call a basically a tour. It's not a tour, but it's just, you know, to see how they see what they're doing. So yes, uh, uh, when you do that, you're putting your life in danger because there are no guarantees that, uh, that, that things are going to end up right. Yeah. And well, how cold was it when you went to bed? In the resort town of Shirokina, which was turned into a military base for the Ukrainians, it was about 15 degrees below zero in the, in the middle of winter. And we were fully dressed in our sleeping bags. We did not take anything off. The commanding officer says, you take nothing off, you keep your gloves on, you keep your, your headgear on, you keep your, everything that you your have. Vest boots, on, your you boots. Have vest, everything you, you keep on because we may have military activity in the middle of the night and you won't have time to get dressed. You've got to move quickly. All right. I want to take the folks back to the fact is you were doing the media campaign mm -hmm. where you had been working for a year, year and a half to organize this, and you did it via television that went across the Ukraine and across the Russian side of the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I liked about it is you're a very unique fellow in that you have asked people that the Ukrainians know. You had businessmen, business women that were Christians that were telling the people how they had mm -hmm. come into a relationship with Christ, how he had changed their life. Mm -hmm. You had sports figures, you had movie star figures that were Christians, you had pop stars. Then you had folks that had broken up their life with drugs and alcohol, which was prevalent. And the thing is, they had come to know Christ and God had changed their life. So you had all kinds of the spectrum of people telling these stories and it was going across the Ukraine. What is a mass media campaign? 
Yeah, let me say, we were showcasing what you were just saying, showcasing the celebrities and the non-celebrities in the nation, which uh, uh, actually uh, communicate very well with people watching the TV programs. But They we know were, those people. They know them. Uh, the stories are survival stories, and that is what they want to hear. They want to know how people made it through the worst storm of their lives, which most Ukrainians are going through right now. And so it, it, it really connected with the people. We showcased them not only on primetime TV, primetime radio, front pages of newspapers, billboards, uh, social media, public transport system. They were everywhere. The faces were everywhere, and they were telling the story, how I survived. One of those stories was uh, of a professor from Donetsk University. Mr. Kozlov, and uh, he had been in prison, uh, imprisoned by the uh, rebel forces for 700 days. And he was in his 700 days in the cellars. He was tortured, he was uh, beaten, and he said that the only way that I ever survived after he was released, he said the only way I survived was because I prayed to the God of heaven every single day. That gave me persevering power, and I survived. Yeah. So you had all kinds of the spectrum of people telling these stories, and it was going across the Ukraine, mm -hmm. and then they would call into your call center mm -hmm. and talk with people about either how to accept Christ or how to get a book that you called The Journey Home, mm -hmm. and uh, all of a sudden, the Russians invaded mm -hmm. the Ukraine yeah. right in the middle of your four weeks of televising. Mm -hmm. You were there. And I want you to tell the folks in our audience, when we talk about the Ukraine, mm -hmm. but the fact is there's a red line that goes from the top all mm -hmm. the way down through Donetsk, all the way down mm -hmm. to a circle down there and yeah. down to the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the left side mm -hmm. was Ukrainian soldiers. Mm -hmm. And in the middle, we're gonna be talking about how you have been bringing wood stoves, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. water, and food, as well as these books mm -hmm. that present the gospel, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. give the folks hope. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. people might think that that's a very little space, but it's 300 miles at least from the top to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And from this red line, if you can see on your television, there's a gray line over here that goes up. Mm -hmm. That's the Russian front line, if you want. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that in between is about how many miles? Uh, that's uh, depending on where you measure, but you're looking at anywhere from 30 to 70 miles. Yeah. And there are millions of Ukrainian people in villages that are inside of this area. Mm -hmm. And right now, the war is going on, and the Ukrainian army is going slow. And they are down here toward this Donetsk area. Mm -hmm. The Russians just blew up a dam, and that's up what, near the West City. Here, be down here somewhere, yeah. Mm -hmm. They blew up a dam down here. Mm -hmm. And why did they do that? The Russians blew up the Kahovka Dam, which is just in the Kherson uh, province area in Kherson City. Uh, they wanted to do that to slow down the advance of the Ukrainian army. They knew that they had a problem. Uh, they were on the losing side, and they needed to find a way to, to massively slow the Ukrainian army down in their counteroffensive. The dam served their purpose. However, they miscalculated a bit. They lost a lot of men in the process because those floodwaters washed many of their military bases away on the left bank of the Dnieper River. Uh, so there was a loss of uh, life for the Russians as well. But it did slow down the Ukrainians, and that's what we're seeing today. They are going slowly. All right. Now, so I just wanted them to know that when you go past that red line, mm -hmm. what you're doing is, you know, you're from Finland. Mm -hmm. You stayed after your media campaign was over. Mm -hmm. And why did you stay? Well, once that media campaign was cut on February the 24th of 2022, the whole country was sent into chaos. Everything stopped. Everything that you knew about normal life or everything that you thought was normal life, everything just ceased to exist. 
massive amounts of people, millions of people surging towards the western border, towards Poland. Uh, public services throughout the country suddenly stopped because the owners of shops, gas stations, pharmacies, uh, department stores, they were fleeing with their families. You know, nothing was working. And so uh, the teams that we had had worked with for seven or eight years prior to that, you know, when the Russians uh, did originally occupy part of that area, well, they were there. And they, they were receiving frantic uh, messages from the frontline villages saying, please help us to evacuate. We don't have the means to leave our localities, our villages, our towns, our small cities. Help us, come and get us. We need to get out of here. Um, and others were saying, we don't have the means to to uh, secure our daily food. We don't have the means to secure water. All our public services are, are, are gone. Infrastructure is being destroyed piece by piece. Uh, help us. We're gonna need stoves. We're gonna need, uh, you know, sources of heating, uh, places to cook our food, we, to get our food, to get our water. It was a massive cry for help, a plea from, from, the, from the people of that whole area. And our teams responded to that, and we were part of that. We were supplying our teams with vehicles. We brought in about 20, over 20 vehicles that helped them to evacuate, helped them to deliver the food and the water and the medical supplies to that whole region along that red line that you see there. Yeah. A couple of things I want people to know is to the left is going toward Poland, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And how many people fled toward Poland when the war started? Well, uh, in, the, in the first few days of the war, we're talking about, you know, one to two million people immediately packed their bags and they headed for the border. At this point in time, 8.5 million people have left Ukraine for Western Europe, including Finland, including our country. Uh, but about six and a half million people that also were part of that surge then settled down on the Western border, right along the border with Poland and uh, Hungary. And, uh, and Czechoslovakia. Yeah, a lot of those people have stayed close to the border because if the Ukrainian soldiers push the Russian soldiers back, mm -hmm. they want to go home. They want to see if they've got anything left. The people that left, were, they took the big risk of just stepping out into the unknown, not knowing where they would end up, who would take them in, who would help them to survive. But those who did not have that, the boldness to take that step into the unknown, they stayed behind along the border. And uh, many, of course, had relatives or friends in Western Ukraine, which helped them. They took them in uh, for a few weeks or a few months until they were able to find the housing or the, the places where they could stay. All right, down at the bottom of the map, folks, inside of the zone that uh, was between the Ukrainians on the left and the Russians on the right, down at the bottom is Mariupol, and this mm. is where you had your telephone center, yeah. and you had all of your telephone operators down there. Mm -hmm. And we here at America, we saw many pictures of how the Russians came in, and they absolutely obliterated Mariupol. They did, yeah. Two days before the attack, we have video footage that has not been shown on primetime TV anywhere of Russian tanks and uh, rebel tanks in huge columns coming straight towards Mariupol. Mariupol was supposed to defend itself. They had 100 tanks in the city ready to fire at the invading army. However, when those tanks closed in on Mariupol, the commanding officers from that region, they were pro-Russian, we found out. Everybody mm -hmm. found out. Mm -hmm. And uh, they fled and they defected to the Russian side and they told the tank commanders, stay put, didn't explain why, just said stay put, don't fire a shot. And so they, the Russians, they rolled into Mariupol without a single shot being fired from any tanks. And that's where the destruction started. Yeah. And it continued for many, many months on end. There are many times that I called you, and in fact, uh, we actually had you come from Mariupol, because in the meantime, you were getting buses. There was 100,000 people that were trapped in the bottom of the apartments. Mm -hmm. that uh, were down in the basement and they couldn't get out. Yes. And there were snipers that would pick them off if they just came out. And you actually took buses and you must have come down one of those little roads there mm -hmm. and uh, you stayed a little distance away from Mariupol, mm -hmm. but you communicated with folks that were in those basements mm -hmm. and you had two buses. 
and uh, they legally could fill 25, but you were taking 40 to 60 to 80 mm -hmm. people sometimes jammed into those buses, mm -hmm. and you took them back out of safety, and you were doing that night after night yeah. after night. And we called you up, and you flew right from Maripol to Finland and came back here, and we were talking about what was going on and what you were facing. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I tell them what we talked about then, one of the things about Mariupol is the chaplain that's high in the Ukrainian army, he was also your chief telephone operator. Mm -hmm. He was your chief that watched over all the other mm -hmm. telephone operators for the media campaign. So the whole country called in to either accept Christ or ask for one of the booklets. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where it was at. And uh, he was there. And in one of those beautiful apartments, the fact is he had a daughter up on the top floor. Mm -hmm. And tell what happened. Well, the night that Gennady called us, that was basically within hours after he had received the news that one of the Russian tanks that, that was in the center of Mariupol on the main street uh, had raised its barrel towards one of the apartment buildings and they shot from the tank and they hit the very apartment where his daughter was living in, totally obliterating that apartment, that apartment suite. And of course her body parts were never found. When he was talking to us, he was weeping like a little child. He could hardly tell us what was happening yeah. as he lost his daughter that night. He's gone on and how many children has he adopted? He has adopted a total of 36 children it's called the Pilgrim Orphanage in Mariupol. That's what they used to run. And so when uh, the, the night of the invasion took place, they had about two hours of warning from, the, from Ukraine military intelligence. Somebody from intelligence said, Gennady, get the kids, get the staff, and run for your lives. Get out of Mariupol. The tanks are here, and you need to go. Yeah. Now, we're doing this program because we're trying to raise money for people in the Ukraine. I want you folks to think about what happened is that when the Russians invaded, they bombed all of the electrical outlets, all of the gas stations, uh, all of the food markets. So if you were left behind in this zone or any other part of the Ukraine, you woke up and you had no power, you had no heat, you had no water, you had no food, and you had no hope. And this is why my friend stayed in the Ukraine to start organizing. How do we get wood-burning stoves to these people? And we're showing them on the screen right now. and We're gonna tell you more as we go along. But the wood burning stove would not only heat the place where they were at, because remember, this happened in February. How cold was it in February? Oh, the parts of the country were down about zero Fahrenheit. Yeah, zero, 10 below, because he slept in 10 below. I'm saying that, what if you were in 10 below zero? You would need warmth. And so he came up with the idea of wood-burning stoves. They could just cut branches off trees, put them into the stove, put them into the little place where they were at, shut everything else up, and they would have warmth to live, to exist. But then he found out they had no food. And so he started bringing in water and food and soup and things for them. And they used the stove to cook the, the soup and uh, had water for drinking, and then he gave them a book with all of these things. And what would you put into this book? Well, that's, that book is called The Road Home. And the reason why we call it The Road Home, it's a handbook actually saying, how do I get home? And the reason for that is because 14, 15 million people that had abandoned their homes, they had fled for their lives out of fear, and others because they were, their homes had and their towns had been destroyed by the Russian army. The number one question on the mind of every single one of these 14, 15 million people was, when can I go back home? Unfortunately, they were asking a question to which the answer was, there is no home to come back to. Yeah, and the fact is, is that people also have to realize life is short and eternity is long. 
And if you want to really go home and you want to be with God for all eternity, yeah. this book yeah. shared the plan of salvation of how Christ had come and given his life, died for them, and, and if they would just come to him, he would forgive their sins, mm -hmm. come into their life, and strengthen yeah. them. This book was written for those who have probably never or very infrequently ever been to a church, and they needed to know, how do I find the God that claims to love me and who claims to have sent his son to die for bad things I've done? That book is just for those people. Therefore, we have a prayer, a model prayer, a prayer of salvation, which allows a person to simply, in the absence of a church or, 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 or you know, Christians, just to sit down, read the prayer, and pray it. It's the first steps. It is the first step to a new life in Jesus Christ. Yeah. I'm talking with Hanu Hauka, and he's the founder of Great Commission Media Ministries with headquarters in Finland and offices here in Canada, the United States. And uh, he's coming right from the front lines of the Ukrainian-Russian war. And as we go along now, I'm going to ask him, where is this war going? Everybody wants to know what's going to happen. What does the future hold? Will the Russians roll right over Ukraine? Or will Ukraine start to push the Russians back? And he's come right from there, and he knows more than any news person that you've been talking to. Thanks for joining us today. Stay tuned. I've got a personal message for you in just a moment. Stay tuned. John will be right back. Today we are showing you that there are millions of people in the Ukrainian war zone that have no food, no water, and no electricity. If they're going to live, they must have food and water and small steel stoves that burn wood for them to keep them warm and to cook their food on. They live in the war zone between the Ukraine army and the Russian army. It is a 300 mile zone that reaches from the top of the Ukraine down to the Black Sea and is 35 to 50 miles wide. Now in this war zone, millions of people in cities and towns are trapped. They need little steel stoves that burn wood for heat so that they don't freeze to death in the winter and lets them cook their food on it during the summer and winter. People can cut wood from trees to burn in their steel stoves. Now, Hanu Hauka, the CEO and founder of Great Commission Media Ministries, with headquarters in Finland. He's my friend, and I want to help him and his team as they are risking their lives each week delivering steel stoves and bags of food for families and grandparents, as well as the gospel. Now, a bag of food for a family of four is usually for a mother and her three children and contains fresh bread, large bottles of water, dried soup packages, canned meat, noodles, macaroni, and powdered milk for small children. They also give them a book called The Journey Home, which contains stories of fellow Ukrainian people who are Christians and appeared on TV in Hanu's media campaign before the war started. These folks told their own survival stories of how God had helped them survive through the worst storms in their lives. The Ukrainian people knew all of these folks because they were well-known businessmen or businesswomen, sports figures, pop singers who had become Christians. And these stories really connected with the Ukrainian people because they were facing the same struggles to survive themselves. Now, during the media campaign, these stories were passed out in the book called The Journey Home. This book also contains a clear presentation of the plan of salvation and a prayer for people to pray to receive Christ into their lives. It also counsels them on how to live with the tragedies of losing their homes and loved ones and how to deal with the post-traumatic stress syndrome that they all are living with. But today I'm asking you to help keep these people alive by providing little steel stoves that burn wood so that people can stay warm and cook their food and water. And you can help these people today by giving one of six things. First, for a gift of $200, you can help us provide one steel wood stove, one bag of food and water for a family of four for a week, and the book, The Journey Home. And all of these items will be delivered by Hanu's ministry teams into the dangerous war zone. Then second, for a gift of $600, you can help us provide three steel wood stoves for three families, three bags of food and water for three families for a week, 
and three books of The Journey Home. Then third, for a gift of $1,000, you can help us provide five steel wood stoves for five families, five bags of food and water for five families for a week, and five books. Then fourth, for a gift of $2,000, you can help us provide 10 steel wood stoves for 10 families, 10 bags of food and water for 10 families of four for a week, and 10 books of The Journey Home. Now, God promises us in Scripture, when you give to the poor, it's like lending to the Lord, and the Lord will pay you back. That's Proverbs 19, 17. In Psalm 41, we read, How blessed is he who considers the helpless. The Lord will deliver him in a day of trouble. That's Psalm 41, 1. Further, right now, the Ukrainian people are open to the gospel. If a church in any of the cities opens on any day of the week, now thousands of people surround the churches. They want to know how Jesus can forgive their sins and live in their lives. And Jesus commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every person. So if God leads you today to give a gift to help, please call us right now at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Or if you wish, you may give your gift at our website at jashow.org. That's jashow.org. And then if you live in Canada, would you please call us at 1-866-746-5803. That's 1-866-746-5803. Or you may also order these items at our Canadian website at jashow.ca. That's jashow.ca. And when we receive your gift, we will send you a receipt and a personal thank you. And finally, please keep this in mind that the John Ankerberg Show broadcasts to potentially 4.5 billion viewers in more than 200 countries and territories. As a 100% viewer-funded ministry, your non-restricted gift also supports the production of several ministry programs and purposes, including the broadcasting expansion and production of The John Ankerberg Show in the U.S. and international markets. I want to thank you for your gifts and for your prayers.